Will you join me in prayer? Father, I pray as we come together today that the Spirit of God be present and that we are aware. I pray that you will open our ears, open our eyes, and open our hearts to hear and to see and to understand what God's Spirit is speaking to us today. May the Spirit be present in all the words that are said through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Brother Matt's away, and you get me again. So, uh, but it is an honor and privilege. It's so good to be here to present the Word of God to you today. A man passed away, and he found himself in front of the pearly gates. <clears throat> and as an angel came up to him and started talking, he said, Now here's the way it works. You have to have a hundred points to get into the pearly gates. Now we're going to assign points based upon your recollection of what you've done on earth. So uh, tell me some things about your life and what you've done. And let's see how many points we can get. So he began, he said, well, I was married for 40 years to the same woman. I was faithful and loved her with all my heart. And the angel said, hey, that's great. That's five points. It gets better. Well, the angel said, what else is there? Well, he, she said, he said, I was faithful to my church. Every Sunday I was there and I loved the fellowship with my fellow Christians all around. And the angel said once again, you know, that is wonderful. That's two points. And then she said, well, what else is there? And he, he said, well, I started a soup kitchen downtown to feed the homeless, and every month I was there to help the other volunteers to feed so that those homeless people could have a little bit more each and every day. And the angel said, that is wonderful. That's one point. Well, the man's beginning a little frustrated, isn't he? So he says, sort of in a stage whisper so the angel can hear him, you know, at this rate, I'll only get in by the grace of God. And the angel said, that's right, a hundred points. Go right in. But that's it. My friends, today the only way that we get into heaven is by the grace of God. There is no other way but through Jesus Christ and His grace. Last week, Matt shared with us about freedom from sin. And Paul today is going to help us to understand even in that freedom, there is some obligations that we need to know about in serving our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, I have an outline for you, so I want you to listen now. I use alliteration because it's a tool to help us to remember. Now, my alliteration today is the letter B. And so here are the four, I'm going to have four points to this outline. So, one, bodies used. Bodies used. Two, blemishes covered or removed. Blemishes covered or removed. Three, bondage confirmed. Bondage confirmed. And finally, bequest received. Bequest means what you receive from a will, you know. Bequest received. Paul was a student of Gamaliel. One of the foremost, if you will, uh, understanders of God's law, the Old Testament. Paul became that too, even as Brother Matt told us last week. He, was an, he understood the Old Testament and where it came from. He knew the point of what was being, if you will, represented through Jesus Christ in the prophecies and other ways that Christ came for us, for our salvation. So, a central part of the Jewish culture 
was always the reciting and the saying of the Shema. Now the Shema is found in Deuteronomy 6. And in Deuteronomy 6 it says this, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus repeats this, but he adds a fourth one. He adds the mind to that. Now, that's from a Greek setting. A little bit of the Greek culture came in in the writings of the gospel writers. But in the Hebrew culture, there was only the three because heart and mind were very, very similar. So let's look at that for just a second. I want you to understand that this is represented in this passage today. First of all, strength. We shall love the Lord with all our strength is the physical. And you'll see a lot of that in this passage. You shall love the Lord with all your soul. That's the spiritual. You shall love the Lord with all your heart. That is the will, the mental, the intellect, our will to do. Now, these are going to be represented. So I hope you'll look, listen with an a ear, a spiritual ear, to hear how these represent in the passage to come. So let's look at the outline for just a minute. Bodies used. The opening passage says that we are no longer to let sin reign in our mortal bodies. We are not to present our bodies as our members, our bodies, our parts of our bodies, our mental body into sin because in doing that, we remain in death. But we are to present our bodies unto righteousness. As a matter of fact, he says that we are not to present our bodies as instruments of unrighteousness. Now, it's very interesting to me, this word instruments in the Greek is the Greek alliteration, hoplon, H-O-P-L-O-N. And it means instruments, of course, but it also is a root in a section of that. It means weapon, and it means armor. And in Paul's writings, you're going to find those two words that we translate into English, but it's the same Greek word each time. The same Greek word for weapon and for armor. Now here's the point of that. We are not to present our bodies as instruments into unrighteousness, mean we are not to present our bodies as weapons of unrighteousness. My friends, I want you to understand that when we sin, it becomes an obvious witness for Satan, not for God. It becomes a weapon for the world for Satan to use, not only in your own individual life, as he tells you how guilty you are, but in the lives of others who look at your witness of sin. You know the words of Mahatma Gandhi. He said, I love your Christ, but I don't think much of your Christianity. We see too many people in the Christian realm who do things that don't look like Christ at all. This is a witness. It's a weapon for Satan, and he will use it with all his might. So Paul said, don't present your bodies as weapons of unrighteousness, but present them as armor. Armor for God that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. You know what he says? Put on the whole armor of God, this very same word, that you may be able to stand, and having done all to stand. We put on God's armor that our bodies are protected and that they become members of righteousness. Now, Jesus has some very strong words that are found in Matthew about bodies being used in sin. He said this, if your eye leads you to sin, pluck it out. It is better to go into heaven with one eye than it is to go into hell with two. If your hand offends you and leads you to sin, cut it off. It is better to go into heaven maimed with one hand than to go into hell 
with two. Those are strong words from Christ himself. We are not to present our bodies as instruments, as weapons for sin. Christ represented it so strongly, he said we need to do away with that member that offends. And just in case you think that's a little bit, I don't do that with my hand or with my eye, this passage follows where Jesus Christ said, to look at a woman with lust in your heart is to commit adultery with her in your heart. Our mental thinking is also an instrument. It is a member of our body that should not be used for sin. Brother Ellis already read this from Matthew 12. I, I mean, from Romans 12. I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present yourself as a living, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your spiritual service, your spiritual worship. Now, we are not to use our bodies in such a way that the devil can make use of them as a weapon. I pray that you will understand what I mean about bodies used. Bodies used for righteousness. Number two, blemishes covered or removed. Paul goes on to say, we are no longer under grace, but we're not under the law, but we are under grace. So, so what, does that mean we should sin in order that grace gets more strong? In the passage earlier, just last week, Brother Matt reminded us that, no, sin should not abound so that grace can abound more. His words at the very beginning say, by no means, and it's the same way here. In the middle of this passage, he said, just because we are no longer under the law, but we are under grace, we do not have the right to sin at our own will. As a matter of fact, here's the way it goes. The promise of grace is freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. It's like this also. Here's the illustration from the point. Blemishes. Ladies, when you have a blemish somewhere on your face or your hands, a lot of times what you do is you cover it up with makeup. When you cover it up with makeup, the blemish is no longer being able to see. You can't see it. But it's still there. Because when you get sweaty and the makeup gets old, it starts to run and it gets washed off, the blemish is still there. It hasn't gone anywhere. You are like, in that sense, sinning so that grace can cover it up again. I'm going to go over and sin so I have grace to cover up the blemish. But that's not what grace does. The Word of God says that our sins are washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. Our sins are removed. They're put away from us as far as the east is from the west. That is the removal of sins. And if you are going into sin because you want grace to be stronger, you are acting like that blemish is still there and has never been removed and it's just being covered up. That is what Paul says, by no means, and the Greek's a little bit more specific. It says, this should not happen. It's even stronger than that. This should not be able to happen. In the King James, it says, God forbid at this point. Also in the middle of it. Now, but the word God is not in the Greek. But it is the word creation. This cannot be created. So if we can't, we don't want to create the illusion of grace being stronger because we can sin, so we can keep on sinning so that grace can be okay. That is where God says no. 
that should not be created. And that's why many of the translations use the word God forbid. God should not create this. God does not want this. God does not create this. By no means should this happen. We are under grace. Grace is what gets us into heaven. But grace also does something else in our relationship to God. And that leads to point three. Bondage confirmed. Brother Matt and I were talking about this sermon last week before he left, and, and he said, yeah, Ray, you're going, I'm, I told him all about last week about being free, and now you're going to tell him you're not. But see, Matt was talking about free from sin. We are free from sin. But we are bound to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. At the very beginning and also through, he says, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Then he says, don't let your sin have dominion over you. Now, the word dominion in the Greek is kyrie uo, kyrie uo. Now, most of you have heard the word kyrie. We hear it usually in relation to kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison is a typical part of the Catholic Mass. It's also very strongly uh, related in Episcopal services. Kyrie eleison means Lord have mercy. But the word Kyrie in itself is not religious. It means the word Lord. But the word Kyrie uo, dominion, is wrapped up in two very important subtitles. One Ownership. Ownership. The Lord that you have owns you. And two, obedience. You obey the Lord that you have. Now, if sin is your Lord, and that's what Paul is saying to many people, if you let sin be your Lord and it has dominion over you, then you have a master. That's why you're a slave to sin. And you obey sin. But Paul says, don't do that. You're actually to become bound to your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that is where the title of this sermon comes in the master and commander of your soul. Jesus Christ is to be the master and commander of your soul. When you are saved, you become a child of God. And as a child of God, who do you belong to? You belong to God. You are His. I love a song, uh, and I, one of these days I'm going to try to sing it by the tallies. It's called, There Are No Orphans. There are no orphans in God's family. You have a father. You have a God who owns you. You're not just out there in the wind. But as a child of God, you also need to obey what did Jesus say? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. We have to realize that we are no longer slaves to sin, but Bob Dylan, that very famous Christian writer, <laughs> said these words. You've got to serve somebody. Yes, indeed. You've got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you've got to serve somebody. If you are not a slave to sin, you are a servant to Christ. There is no middle ground. You are either a slave to sin 
Are you a servant of Christ? And Paul says, let's be bound to righteousness. Let's be bound to Christ. Once again, the words of Christ in the book of Matthew. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What we do in serving Christ because of the grace that we have should not be hard. Oh, I didn't say it wouldn't be difficult. But the Spirit of God leads us and it strengthens us. The Word says that the, the Spirit of God gives us words to say when we don't know what to say. The joy of the Lord is my strength. We are strong in the Lord Jesus Christ. In our weakness, He is made strong. Over and over and over again in God's Word, we see the necessity of being a servant of God. And that's what Paul is saying. Not a slave to sin, but a servant to righteousness. So what's the result and that's the last point. Bequest received. When you write a will and they come to your death and they go to the lawyer's office and they read the will, if you get something, you get a bequest. A bequest. In Paul's writing, he uses the word fruit. Now the Greek word for fruit here is a result of an action. It is the result or what happens when something is done. So Paul just puts it up straight and very frank before you. He says, okay, if you sin, if you have an action, if you present your bodies as members into sin to do this, here's your fruit. It's death. I don't know if any of you have done it but I have, you, you, at an apple orchard, there's apples on the ground. And you can look around and see them, and they look, some of them look really good. They look so nice. You pick up one of those that looks so nice, and you forget, you don't see that little black hole that's in the top. So you cut the apple open. What do you see? Worms, blackness, rot. That's the death of the fruit of sin. And when sin gets into your life, and that is the fruit that results. But Paul says, the fruit of being bound to Christ and bound to righteousness is sanctification and eternal life. So let's use just the word life. The same illustration. You look on an apple tree and you look up there on the tree and you take the apple. It looks so wonderful. It's fresh. It's clean all the way around. And as you take it and cut it open, you have such fresh and sweet and juicy fruit. And it tastes so good and fresh and full of life. This is the fruit of following Christ. It is life. Paul says, as he concludes this passage, and you should know that's Romans 6, 23. It's a part of what you should know to tell anyone. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Today, the question is, who do you serve? Do you serve sin? Now listen, in grace, you're free from sin, but that, you still, are you presenting your members into sin? Or do you serve righteousness? Is Jesus Christ your 
Master and Commander and Lord? I conclude with a verse you've heard it already twice. Now we're going to hear it one more time. I urge you, brethren, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know the good and acceptable and pleasing will of God. My friends, today, this is God's message. This is the writing of Paul. Be a child of God. Live as His servant. In Jesus' name, amen.